All right, church, well, uh, welcome. And uh, let's open up to 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 and 18. As you're finding your place there, I wanna just draw your attention to one thing in uh, our bulletin. Uh, coming up on February the 16th, uh, it's a really, really important day in the life of our church. One of the things that I hope to do with us um, over the years is two to three times a year, we wanna gather together on a Sunday evening. Uh, we wanna combine the worship services. We're gonna have a little bit of worship on that evening. Uh, but the main reason why you wanna come to be a part of this evening in particular is because it's gonna give me an opportunity to cast some vision on where our church is headed. Uh, more importantly, answering the question, who is it that we're trying to become and who do we wanna become as a church? Uh, we're gonna go back and look at some things over the past few years and just kinda uh, reconcile where we are uh, now and how we got here and then why we're moving forward in the direction uh, that we, we wanna move forward in. Um, so we, we picked 530 because uh, we want you young families, childcare will be provided, but you feed your kids, come, it'll be an hour service and then off we go. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get going and get you guys out of there um, soon after that. If you found your place uh, in First John uh, this morning, we're just simply talking about the rhythms and finding the rhythms of Jesus. Uh, in particular, what I mean by that is the, the routines. Asking the question, if God has saved us and called us for purpose, what is our purpose and what did he save us for? And primarily what that functions is, is that our goal and aim in life is to be more like Jesus. Our thoughts, our actions, how we serve, how we give, how we think, all of those things need to be informed by the rhythms and the routines that we see in the scriptures that Jesus laid out for his people. We need to adopt that. All of us have rhythms in our life and we choose certain particular behaviors and habits for a reason. We, we gravitate towards some things over the other. So uh, my wife and I, my family, we live uh, about a mile and a half down the road, uh, right behind TCU on, uh, on Rogers Avenue. And what we learned is we moved here, uh, we got here and school was getting out. And then over Christmas break, there were really no college students in our neighborhood. But ever since TCU came back, all right. Um, I was informed that uh, there's this thing that uh, I, I didn't know this word. And so I'm not trying to say it to be cool because I'd, I'd sound very uncool, but there are things called darties. Does I say that right? A darty. All right. So you know what a darty is? A darty, this is gonna make some of you older folks feel really young and hip. Um, a darty is just simply when you throw a day party. Okay. And so apparently my street in Fort Worth is the place for darties. Okay especially on Sunday afternoons. And I mean, we walked out several weeks ago and this has happened multiple days where there's this one particular house and I think some of their guys actually go to our church maybe, uh, but I haven't identified them yet. I'm gonna find you, if, I'm gonna find you, okay? I'm gonna find you. Um, they have this rhythm and this routine where, uh, and it's a very cool thing, but they, there's like 500 people in this backyard of like 500 square feet, okay? And uh, apparently last week it involved a spray paint and spray painting the neighbor's fences and like all kinds of like college things that you would expect, right? Like this is their rhythm and this is their rhythm that they're sort of walking in. And, and part of me is like, man, I really wish I was still in college. And then part of me is like, I'm really thankful I'm not in college anymore, right? Um, good for you guys, right? Go for it, have a blast. But all of us have rhythms and we've got routines that we get in. And in 1 John chapter three, what he does for us is he sort of paints this rhythm, this picture of this habit, really two things in particular, that Jesus embodied that we're gonna challenge the church with a little bit this morning and challenge how we think about the gospel and how we think about what our church should be like. So we saw last week this idea of God calling his people to publicly live in a right way, to live in righteousness on display for the world to see as opposed to choosing sin and what he says is, is just simply lawlessness. And then what happens is, is that he, he transitions to say, okay, choose to live rightly with God, be right with God and put that on display for the world to see. And then here are two really practical ways that you can embody the righteousness of Christ found in verses 11 and 18. And so we're gonna look at verse 11 very quickly. He says this, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. A really, really simple, yet a really profound message. 
You've heard it before, you've heard it say again, and here's the reminder, you've heard this from the beginning, you have been called to love one another. He puts this in the Greek in the present tense, and and what he means is, he's simply just saying that there ought to be this continual and constant habit or rhythm that exists in your life that you are regularly showing and displaying your love, get this, he's not talking about your lost friend, but rather he's talking about your brother or sister in the church, your brother or sister in Christ in this moment. He's addressing the church and he's calling the church in essence to be the church by lovingly displaying and living out the gospel to one another on a regular basis and showing that love in really practical and very tangible ways. What we've said over the past few months as part of our core values and who we are and what helps define our culture. And we're gonna say it again until we're just sick and tired of hearing it because it's only when we get sick and tired of hearing it do do I believe that we've actually captured it and we've actually gotten it. And the way we say this and what we mean embodies this is just simply circles more than rows. Now, as a preacher, I love corporate gatherings. I love singing with God's people of all walks of life. I love seeing this church full of people in these rows. And there is a place for these rows. There is a place for a corporate gathering like this with music that resonates our heart and reflects our hearts. But here's the deal. God has called his people to form and to make disciples, to reproduce. And it's really difficult Though corporate gathering is a part of the discipleship making process, it's not the end goal is just to get somebody here in the pews, but our ultimate end goal as a church is to push people in a direction where they move from the pew and into the circle. And the answer is, well, why would we do that? And it's really simple. Because the only way in church life that you are ever known or you can know other people is if you are regularly engaging them in a habit of meeting together and sharing one another's burdens and needs and where we are in life. Think about it this way. There's a reason why fraternities and sororities are so popular on campuses because what it tends to do on a really large campus, whether there's 10,000 students or 50,000 students, it it intends to take a really large organization and to bring it down to a smaller level where you can actually know people and not just be a number in the crowd. Now we're not a fraternity and we're not a sorority. We've been given the gospel of the Lord Jesus and our call and our commitment is that we would pursue community alongside one another because here's the truth that we need to remember according to this text. If we're called to love one another, fundamentally it rests in this truth that disciples are made in community. This is where they're made. This is where our formation takes place. Our pulpit ministry, our corporate gathering, all of these things are meant to complement one another into the context of a small group, into community. Now you say, well, where do we get that idea of community from? And I'll say, I'm so glad you asked that question. And the answer to that at its very basic form is that we understand community fundamentally because of what we understand about the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit exist in perfect community. They function, they play a a role in the Godhead to bring about God's purposes on this kingdom and in this life. And so here you have the God that we serve that is in community with itself, in relationship with himself, serving and working and doing different things. And here in this moment, we understand that our discipleship, our formation has to be, it must be formed in the context of the community that God has given. For this message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then what he does in verse 12 is he gives us a a good example of, of how not to love each other. Sometimes the best way to know something and to understand it is to see what it doesn't mean. And so in verse 12, he goes on and he illustrates it this way. He says, listen, we shouldn't be like Cain, who was of the evil one, murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, this is the story found in Genesis 4, verses 2 through 8. Just summarized, essentially, it's this. Both brothers come and lay an offering before the Lord. Abel lays his offering. Cain lays his offering before God. 
God deems that Abel's offering before him was worthy and Cain's wasn't for a variety of different reasons, primarily because of motive and desire and, his, and his, the inward parts of his heart were, were off and wrong. And so God says, this is not an acceptable offering. And so Cain sees his brother being elevated in the eyes of, the, of, of God and this bitterness, this, this jealousy begins to sort of enrage his heart. And then what begins to happen is he ultimately leads him to this posture where he takes the life of his brother. And in the text in verse 12, I want you to notice this word murder. Because I've heard some commentators make a point that, that, man, he just got caught up in the emotion of things and, and they sort of uh, let Cain off the hook. But this, this word in particular that, that John uses, it, it literally means that he, he instigated this violent butchering death like you butcher an animal. Like he was enraged. And it wasn't just enough to, there was no humiliation, there was no shame, but, but he wished upon his brother this violent Death, no, no different than an animal if you were to, to take its life. Now, when we back out of that and we look at verse 12 and we say, hey, he, he's telling us not to be like Cain. And then when we go and we read and we understand Genesis 4 is in the context of Cain having these desires and this bitterness within his heart rooted up by comparison. The thing that it makes me think of is this. There's a famous quote by Teddy Roosevelt. And a lot of theologians sort of jumped on it because it speaks to the truth of the scripture. And, and I think it's a true statement that scripture reflects. And Teddy Roosevelt was the first one that I believe that said it. Tim Keller took it and sort of popularized it. But the statement sort of goes like this. Comparison is the thief of joy. That if you want to be a joyless Christian, find yourself constantly in comparison to other people. Looking at the things that you don't have and wishing that I had this in my life, or I lived in this house, or I had this family, or I had this boyfriend or this girlfriend, or had this sort of status amongst. And so the more we compare, the more it begins to erode and corrode our hearts before our God. And, and what ends up happening is we begin to, to have this inferiority complex where, where all of a sudden, all that we're doing is trying to one up the comparisons that we're making. And, and even the, the silliness of this um, has further implications that one of the primary ways that we compare ourselves is through the use of social media, right? So we post pictures in a very flattering way. We alter and doctor the pictures and we say, look at how sweet my, I mean, we do this all the time. Like Haley makes me look good on Instagram when she posts family pictures. I don't look that good all the time, right? Like there's this masquerade of, of things that are going on. So here's the crazy thing. You start to like those things and then you know within your heart, I really wanna be like that or I want that. And what you're liking is something that actually doesn't even ex it exist in reality. And so what you're liking is, is equivalent with like a Disney movie that, that's not real. And then what happens is your joy in the Lord just sort of erodes. And we can do this individually, but we can also do this corporately. And what I mean by that is this, is that as a church, one of the most dangerous places that we can be is to look at other churches and go, hey, look what they're doing. Why can't we do that? Look at the road that they've paved. We should be paving that road. We should be moving in that direction. And let me just tell you, as one of your pastors, one of your elders, let me just say this. I love Travis. I love this church. I love all the wonderful great things about it. I love all the wonderful wrong things that are about it. Like I love everything about it. It's a, it's a messy place at times, but listen to me. It's a good place. And the Lord is here. And, and here's the thing that we need to sort of be cautious of in doing this is not compare someone else's path as a church to our own. Because listen, here's the deal. We're going to pave our own path. And our model is not some church growth strategy. Hey, this church is doing this. We should then go do this. But rather this, our model is this, is that we are a people of this book and we're gonna pave the way that's already been identified in scripture and we're gonna walk these paths and these precepts and these principles that exist and we're gonna seek to be obedient to Christ as God has given the giftedness in our church with our people, with our staff, with, with our congregation. We are going to be Travis not anybody else. That's so freeing to me. It should be freeing to you. Like we're our own people. And we want to be, if conformed to anything, we want to be not conformed to the patterns of this world, but be conformed to the image of the Son. 
And so we're going to walk our own path as we submit to the scriptures and, and yield to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. But then John goes on and he says this. He says, listen, the more vocal you get about your message of loving people and caring for one another, notice what he says in verse 13. He says this, when you start to do that, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Now let me say this to us. It's one thing to be hated because of the gospel. It's another thing to be hated for the wrong things. And what I mean by that is I've, I've known people in my life, I've even been this person before, where you can be abrupt in your personality, you can be short with people, harsh, demeaning, overly critical, and people are just like, ah, man, I, I don't necessarily want, that's not compelling to me, I don't want that version of Jesus, and I don't either. And so the idea is, is that the world is gonna hate us based on how we love and care for one another, and as we become the people that God wants us to be, and that ultimately when the world hates us, we need to make sure that they're hating us for the right things and not the wrong things. And so if scripture says it, we wanna believe it, and we wanna yield to it, and we wanna advocate for those things. It's natural for the world to hate you because listen to this, the world hates our father. Like the world is not in line with, with the kingdom of God and what God is doing here on this earth. And so what his is, what is sort of reminder is, is, is don't be surprised or really stop being surprised. Don't descend down to the level of hatred and, and vitriol. And, and I see this in some of the pastoral circles that I, that I sort of uh, watch from afar online or you see this on social media and you see just believers like getting down in the mud with each other, like throwing rocks at, at, at each other for no reason. And it may make them feel good temporarily, but the idea here is that the more we love Jesus, the deeper the world is going to hate us. But what, what verses 12 and 13 are, are communicating is, is essentially this, is that when the gospel really takes root in your heart, what's going to happen is there is going to be an increase of, of fruit in your life that looks like love for brothers and sisters. The overly critical spirit, and I'm, when I say critical spirit, I'm not talking about asking questions. That's not being, asking questions is okay and it's right and it should be welcome. I'm talking about an over harshness at times. Wait, husbands can be overly harsh to their spouses or, or vice versa, or a dad can be harsh to his son as he seeks to discipline. I'm talking about a harshness that exists apart from the spirit of God existing in someone's life. And the more we love Jesus, the deeper the world is gonna hate us. And one of the ultimate ways in which we display that love for our savior is that we're regularly telling people about that. We're pursuing people that are far from God and we're going after those people. And so here's the question that I wrestled with this week and really have wrestled with in previous weeks too, is who is it that I'm pursuing in my life that is far from God and who am I going after? And so I've, I've been here now for almost two and a half, three months, I think, somewhere around there. And uh, I have my office and I have a study that's on the, on the side of building C and and my, my office, my study, it, it runs up against where the bus stop is here on Barry. Yes, this way, right? And there's a bus stop that gets let off there. And then, and then there's like this alleyway that the city won't let us close it off. And so they get off the bus stop, they walk through our parking lot right by where my, my study is. And they, they, they live over here. They live in this community. And so there's been several instances where um, I'm, I'm tired. I'm ready to go home. It's the end of the day. Uh, I'm even late coming home. And this is even when we were commuting, you know, almost an hour to get here. And there was one particular moment where I walked out. I had my hands full in my, with my bags. I was carrying different things. The sun was down. I walked around the corner just in time to run into these two guys who were headed to, I think, the, the CBD stores where they were headed. Because the question I got as we sort of fumbled all of our stuff, and he's like, hey, man. You got a cigarette? And so my response was, well, let me see. Uh, no, man, I don't, I don't have one on me. And the other guy looks at me, he's like, you got a light? And I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't have a light. And there was a split second in my mind where I was like, I, I do not, I don't know who these guys are. I'm so ready to see my wife. 
and I want to be with my kids. I just want to go. And within a matter of seconds, I, I knew immediately, said, that Drew, stop. I know this is inconvenient on your personal time and you're gonna hit rush hour because of this. And so within a matter of seconds, I said, I don't have a light, but I do know someone who is the light. Let me tell you about him. And I began to share. Just two weeks ago, I walked out of my office, same thing. I'm always prepared now when I walk out, like looking around the corner, looking for those guys, right? I mean, rough guys. And I heard some noise in the dumpster and I, and I look over and I thought there was an animal or something in there. And, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I see this head sort of pop up. He hears me, I hear him. We make eye contact. I was like, I don't know if I'm supposed to see you or not or whatever. Like I'm, you know, he kind of looked at me like he knew he wasn't supposed to be. I said, what are you doing? I said, what's going on, man? He said, oh, I said, you looking for food or what's going on? He said, no, I'm looking for treasure. I said, oh, treasure, huh? I spent the first 17 years of my life looking for treasure in all the wrong places. It wasn't until I was 17 years old that the Lord got a hold of me and he saved me. And I haven't been looking for treasure since because I have found it in a person, in Jesus, not, not in a dumpster, not in a, in, a, in a location, not in a place, not in a town. Let, let me tell you about it. And so here's, here's where all this is headed and here's my challenge to you. Sometimes I encounter Christians that say, well, I, my circle, I don't, have, I don't have people far from God near me. I don't know where to go to find them. And here's, here's my altar call invitation for you. If you will come and bring a lawn chair and set up outside my study, <laughs> that I guarantee you within any given day, you will encounter 50 to 100 people that just drive, walk by my window off and on. And many of these people, they, they do not know the Lord. And they don't know the goodness of God, the graciousness of God of our savior. We wanna be a church that's for the nations and sending people. We wanna be a sending church, but, but here's also the truth for our church and our location. God has brought the nations to our church. And there are people of all walks of life, of all, all backgrounds, of all economic classes, rich, poor, um, everywhere in between. They're here, like here. Like I can throw water balloons at them out of my window, right? I can yell at them as I'm in, like they're here amongst us. And so this is the posture that John's reminding his people that we want to be and need to be a, a sharing church that loves people and, and loves the lost. And, and here's, here's where I sort of landed on this. When I was in that split second was wrestling with my convenience over my conversion, here's the sort of the aha moment or the light bulb that went off in my head. The real, we, the real reason for me, and maybe you'll find yourself in the midst of this truth and, and ask this question honestly, is the real reason we don't often share is that we value our convenience more than our conversion. I don't mean to sound heavy handed with that, but it's a real statement that even me as your pastor, like I wanna go home and be with my kids. I wanna watch Netflix and just hang out. Maybe go to a darty someday, okay? Like I, I, like I don't wanna be on all the time, you understand? But the idea of, of serving other people, it has nothing to do with convenience, but rather with a passion for what the Lord is doing and what he can do. And our love of others flows ultimately from a love of God. And so we see this rhythm and this posture of love, but, but I want you to see in verses 16 and 18, this, this posture of service that is oriented around the people of God. He says this in verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is just simply called a, a posture of, of gospel gratitude, like overwhelmed with the goodness of God. And then I understand this idea that people are my mission. Like they're the reason why God has called me. It's not a program. It's not, a, not an event. All of those things are good if ultimately they lead to the relationship with the people that I'm trying to invest in. But the idea here is one of which in which the love and the service that he's talking about is one of sacrifice. When he paints this picture, we know that Christ laid down his life for us in a great sacrifice. Therefore, we must sacrifice our lives for the brothers, for the church, and for those who have yet to hear and to know and respond. He says it a different way, or Paul does in Galatians 6. He says to carry one another's burdens in this way and you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. I 
I don't know about you, but I'm probably more prone to carry my own personal burdens and maybe the burdens of my immediate family. I'll carry those because I'm with them. There's proximity and there's closeness and, and nearness. But how well am I, how well are you, how well are we carrying the burdens of other people? This is the call. He doesn't say carry your own burden. He says carry one another's burdens, the church, to to carry those burdens around. And listen, you can't carry a burden if you're not in a circle. It's impossible. If you're not pursuing biblical community with with somebody, whether it's on a Sunday morning or whether it's on a a Tuesday night or or a Wednesday night, like you're not in people's like business in that sense and they're in yours and you're, you're willingly letting them and inviting them in. Listen, it's very difficult at that moment to carry therefore the burden. So he ends this way and he says, but if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, it closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, there's that phrase again that we've seen. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. In other words, it's simply this. Real love is spoken and shown. So my, my sweet bride and I been married 15 years and over 15 years, and, and every year for our anniversary, we try to get away and do something. Whether it be big or small, we, we try to spend time with each other. And if, if I, as her husband, said that I'm gonna save all my love, all my affection, all my affirmation, anything that I would say that I need to be doing as a husband to support you, if I'm just gonna reserve that, Haley, for that anniversary day. I'm gonna hold it all back until then. We're not gonna regularly talk. We're not gonna have conversations. We're not gonna pursue uh, any of the things that God has called us to do. I wouldn't be a, a very great husband. And so my wife, therefore, and I need it too, she needs to hear from me regularly that I love her and that I, I speak that word into her, that, I, that I'm proud of her, that I think this of her. I need to tell her, like, with my words and my actions that I think she's beautiful. I think she's stunning. And, and I guess in turn, she needs to tell me I'm beautiful and stunning. I don't know. Like, <laughs> like I need to hear that. You, you need to hear that. Your, your kids need to hear those things. But listen to me, we, we need to do those things alongside and pursue as we pursue and speak our love for our Father in heaven and as we show and display our Father in heaven that we have fruit in our life. And so how do we do that and how do we bring this to a close? Well, there, there are a couple of things that I want you to know. One, we need to seek to serve rather than to be served. If we're gonna embody John 3, 11 through 18, we have to seek a posture of service. And so here, here's the best thing that I know to say when it comes to community, that if we can capture this, man, our church would, would explode within the next months. And it's a really simple idea. And if everybody captures this, things change almost immediately. Too often we come to church to find community, to find it, to discover it. And there's a place for that. But what if, the shift occurred if everybody came to church not seeking to find community, but rather seeking to create community. What happens? If I no longer come to find it, but rather I'm gonna be the creator, I'm gonna be the instigator, I'm gonna be the one that starts and that brings it together and begins this new work under the umbrella of Travis. If everybody captures that vision, if everybody captures that heart, I'm coming to create it, not to find it. I'm coming to yes, belong and to know and to be known, but I'm coming rather to know other people and to seek service over being served. And so we seek to serve rather than to be served. But a second way we do that is simply just leveraging our talents and our resources for other people. God gives things for us to give them away. He gives us gifts and abilities and insight and wisdom at times. And and he wants us to leverage those things for his kingdom. The third way, just very quickly, is we share in people's pain and sorrow. You can't do that if we're in a row. We gotta do that in circles to really know where people are. Are. And the last thing, and I think maybe this is the most important for our church moving forward, and I say this carefully and I, and I mean this, if we're to be on mission with God, 
to be obedient to what he's calling us to do, to share the burdens, to love in word and talk and in deed and truth, then we must be a people who are willing to build our life around people who are far from God. Like our aim are those people that don't know the Lord. So we say, my in circle of influence Who are the people in my life that that are far from him? They ask you for a light and you say, I don't have a light, but I know the light. They say, I'm looking for a treasure. And you say, "I, I don't know about that treasure, but let me tell you about my great treasure. And maybe it's random chance. There's no such thing as that or divine appointments. Maybe it's strategic and going to the same place to get your hair cut. Joining like, you know, God forbid we would join not Christian gyms, but like just regular gyms with regular people and engaged lost people. Like go be one of those crazy CrossFitters, except we don't want to hear about your CrossFit workout, okay? But go join that with the purpose. You know how you tell somebody's a CrossFitter? They tell you, you know, okay? That's how you know, all right? CrossFitters, you, you know that's true. But go join places and be a part, like expand your your areas to reach people with the gospel. Several months ago, there was a famous celebrity who alleged that he had given his life to Christ. He's a pretty prominent figure in pop culture. He's, uh, at least for me, because I didn't like his style of music, no offense, I just knew him because he kicked Taylor Swift off the stage one time at the VMAs and kind of boot her down. You know what I'm talking about? Kanye, right, with me? If you don't know the name Kanye, go Google it later. You know how Kanye got got saved? I I don't know whether he's genuine or not. I know we can see fruits and we'll, we'll see, we don't know. We need to just stop judging people first of all, lay off him for a little bit. He's gonna do some weird things. He doesn't have doctrine down like like some of you do. Like it's okay, slow on-ramp of discipleship. Get off the gas pedal a little bit. But how he came to know Christ is, is really simple. It's old school, okay? It's like 1950s, 1980s, right? So one of the most prolific culture, cultural artists of, of our time and a generation that cannot understate his influence. His pa- not his his the guy that led him to the Lord was a, was a pastor preaching at a, at a church that was under the umbrella. He was a, a master's student. John MacArthur was a student. He, he gives this invitation to his church. He says, listen, you come back next week, invite somebody far from God and bring them to church. That's all he said. Bring somebody to church next week that doesn't know Christ. Pretty easy challenge, right? So there happened to be a lady sitting in the church that I think knew of a person that knew the Kardashians, like literally like knew the mom, Chris, whatever her name is. And she said, okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna just go out on a limb here. Like if you've watched their show or whatever, I'm not recommending it, but you're like, there's no way, right? I'm gonna go out on a limb and just extend an invitation. And so uh, the lady who hears her preacher's message goes and extends the invitation. And, and wouldn't you know it, like the next week or soon after that, they all showed up at the church. Like, can you imagine, like if that kind of celebrity walked in, like I think some of us would, like we would freak out, really, we don't know what to do, you know, like. And he hears this gospel message and the Holy Spirit of God like gets a hold of him. And, and best we can tell, I don't know, like we'll judge him later, the Lord knows, but like he gives his life to Christ. And it was just one simple lady that, that just said, I'm, I'm gonna ask, why not? Because here's the deal, over the days of just people showing up at churches, it's kind of over. 80% of people that come as guests to churches, you know why they come? It's not because of the music, it's not because there's a young preacher, it's not because he's wearing skinny jeans or deep V-necks or he has, you know, he goes to darties or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. They come because somebody asked them to. Come with me, come and see. That's all it is. So here's how I wanna end today. I want our church to yearn for the day that we see far from God come to know him. We see that the lost are saved. Like we, I believe God can still do that in our city. God doesn't do any big movements apart from his people praying. He sort of aligns himself or we align ourselves with his mission by prayer. 
And I'm wondering if we just end our, our invitation today with just God's people down at this altar, just begging God, crying out to God and saying, God, help me reach someone far from God. And if you don't know who that is, you tell me what day this week you're coming with a lawn chair and I'll sit out there in Homeless Alley with you and we'll, we'll win some people to the Lord, I promise. But we gotta get up, put our boots on. We gotta walk forward. We gotta go get them. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you that you saved us. You died for our sins. You died a death that we could not. Give us a heart for people that don't know you. Give us a heart for your word and to walk in obedience and service to others. Help us, God, we pray these things in Christ's name. I'm going to be down front praying. If you need to talk, just tap me on the shoulder. I'd love to pray with you. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, we'd love to talk with you about that. There's some other gentlemen and ladies that would love to visit with you about that. But would you come pray with me as we cry to our God, saying, God, move, save some people far from you, save our city save our city. You stand and let's respond as the Lord leads.